how are wages determined? Uh, they are not a random distribution of something to some people who we like more, but we want to look at how wages are actually determined. So the first thing we'll start off is Nick Saban, the football coach at University of Alabama, is paid $9.1 million a year, and the average history professor at Alabama earns about 100000 so let's say 1% of what Nick Saban makes. Uh, is that proof that we care more about athletics and football more than we do about academics? And a lot of people say yes, that this does prove this, but it's not true at all, actually. Uh, we say the same with education. Uh, people will say well, the average teacher makes $65,000 a year, Nick Saban's $9.1 million. Obviously, we care more about football, but our actual expenditures on education are much, much greater than on football. Uh, but we can do a little, you know, let's, let's try a little experiment here. Suppose we randomly selected 100 football coaches from BCS programs and got rid of them. Would the quality of the game be the same? And it would be. It'd be hard to replace those top people. Now, what if we randomly selected 100 history faculty from the same schools and got rid of them? Would the quality of history education be the same? And yeah, it would be. They're easily replaceable. We could easily replace history professors. We could see this when a top football coach leaves. There are very few people who could step in and fulfill that the same role. Uh, but when we look at uh, you know history professors, when one history professor leaves, there are 300 applicants that are showing up for a given job, and there are many, many people who could do that. And this is the reason why a few years ago when Baylor was going through a controversial recruiting scandal, uh, the football program was, instead of getting rid of the football coach, they demoted the president of the university and kept the football coach in place. Now, eventually the coach was fired, but the argument was it was easier to, re easier to replace the president of the university than it was to replace the football coach. So why does a president of a college earn more than most professors? And again, there could be some places where, say, a, a professor in the medical school earns more than the president. Or why does a medical school, the median medical school professor, earn more than the median economics professor? Why does the median economics graduate earn more than the median trust and PGM graduate? Why do nurses who work in pediatric oncology wards earn more than nurses in maternity and newborn baby wards? And why do people who clean the windows of high-rise buildings earn more than the people who clean the windows of a strip mall? So we're going to do two parts. The first part is going to be labor demand, and then the second part we're going to look at labor supply. So moving on to labor demand, we look at production. Our output is produced by a combination of capital and labor. We have people and machines, and we can draw this out with an equation that the total output quantity is alpha times some function of capital and labor, where alpha represents basically the productivity of labor. It's a scalar for the productivity of labor, and capital and labor are capital is a quantity or the units of capital, and L is the number of workers hired or the quantity of labor. could actually be labor hours. Uh, we want to look at the total labor and the total amount of capital used to produce output. In the short run, we know that capital is fixed, so in the short run, we'll say that the production function here is just output as a function of alpha times some function of labor. And so now we're only going to be working with workers. In the long run, we know all inputs are variable, but in the short run, we're going to say it's just a matter of labor. So looking at the cost function for a company, total cost is equal to the rental rate on capital times the number of units of capital we have plus say, the hourly wage rate and the number of labor hours that are worked. Now R again is the rental rate on capital and even if we own all the capital we still want to include the imputed rent, how much we could rent that out for. So that's an opportunity cost if not a direct rental payment and wage rate is the hourly wage that workers use and this would also include anything with benefits and things like that. We'll assume that there are the wage is the same for everybody. We'll assume that all workers are exactly the same, and we'll just say that the wage rate is a constant, just to make this easier. So we look at marginal cost. The marginal cost is the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. And again, in the short run, capital is fixed, so what we can say with marginal cost is marginal cost would be only the change in labor. Wages are held fixed, so it would be the change in labor divided by change in quantity. The wage rate times the change of, in labor divided by change in quantity. That right part of the equation, delta L over delta Q, should look familiar. When we looked at productivity and production, we said what is the change in output divided by change in labor, and that was the marginal product of labor. 
So I could invert this and put it in the denominator, and I will in just a second. Before that, I want to look at marginal cost, and we know that the profit maximizing rule of thumb always is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So let me substitute marginal cost, I'll use marginal revenue, and say marginal revenue is equal to wage divided by the marginal product of labor. I simply took the change in L or delta L divided by delta Q and inverted that and put it in the denominator, and I now have wage divided by the marginal product of labor. And lastly, I can multiply both sides by the marginal product of labor. And what we find is that the wage rate is determined by the marginal revenue, my increase in revenue by hiring one worker, times the marginal product of labor, that actual worker. So if I can hire one more worker to produce, uh, let's say I'm, I have a bakery, and I can hire one baker, and I sell my loaves of bread at $3 each, marginal revenue would be $3. The marginal product of labor would be, say, five loaves of bread. I'd be willing to pay up to $15 uh, per hour for that worker. So labor demand is determined by the productivity of labor and the value of the output that labor produces. So I can be really, really productive at producing something, but if it really has little value to people, I'm not going to earn that much money. On the contrary, if I produce very little of something, let's say it takes a long time to do it, but it's really valuable, let's say a piece of artwork, then the wage would be very very high. So we're going to look at what's called the marginal revenue product which is the marginal product of labor times marginal revenue and the value of marginal product which is marginal product of labor times price. Now the left applies to a price searcher firm that would be a monopolist or a firm in a imperfectly competitive market a duopoly where on the right side that would be with a firm that is in a perfectly competitive market, they have to charge the same price. So that remains constant. The price remains constant, whereas marginal revenue, it depends on how much we're producing. What shifts the demand curve will include changes in the demand for what the labor produces. Again, if I have a bakery and people really don't like bread anymore, then my demand for bakers goes down. There's not much need for bakers. We call this derived demand because the, derived, the demand for labor is derived from what that labor produces. Uh, new technology or new skills that make labor more productive will increase my demand for labor. So having more machines will actually increase labor demand. Some people think it'll decrease it. It will increase labor demand. We'll see how it may decrease quantity demanded of labor, but it does increase labor demand. Having more skills makes people... Well, We'll look at what's called labor augmenting capital and labor replacing capital. Right now with labor augmenting capital, it would increase the demand for labor. Labor replacing capital would certainly make uh, the quantity demanded of labor decrease. And elasticity of labor demand is based on the available substitutes for the labor and then the elasticity of demand for the good or the service that labor produces. If I have really unique skills and talents that people can't replace them, then I'm going to have, then to anybody looking to hire me is going to have a very, very inelastic demand for my labor services. And that's what I want. I want to have unique skills that aren't easily replaceable. It's also true that if I'm producing something that ha that's really, there's a very, very inelastic demand for that service, then there's going to be inelastic demand for my service. So if I'm a doctor, uh, there's going to be more inelastic demand for my labor services because there's more inelastic demand for the services of medicine. So we can draw these up. Let's take a look at a pretty elastic demand curve. This demand is the marginal product of labor times marginal revenue, so the marginal revenue product of labor. And this worker, which there are plenty of people here, there are plenty of people who can do this job. Matter of fact, we're going to look at, you know, say at this point here, 16 million people can do this job, and they're going to earn $20,000 a year. Notice that on the uh, y-axis, it's wage, which is $1,000 per year. So because there are many people who can do this job, the marginal product or the marginal value of that last worker hired is not that great. Now we can move up the, the demand curve towards the left and see it gets higher. Yeah, when we hire fewer workers, the marginal value of their services is much higher. We're going to see this with Nick Saban in a second. Um, we can see right here that the marginal value of, say, the four millionth worker is very high. That's $60,000 a year. But what we look at with wage is the marginal value. So if I hire, let's say I have 10 people who work at my fast food restaurant, if I only hired two, the marginal product of their services is very, very high, those two workers. But as I keep hiring more workers, that marginal productivity declines. We saw this when we looked at the marginal product of labor. 
and therefore if you want me to hire more workers that wage has to decline it'll decline to twenty thousand dollars on this in this case here we have a more inelastic demand for labor services and we can see that you know it's seven million people the wage is twenty thousand dollars a year now again this is more inelastic demand curve but up here you see hundred and forty thousand dollars for the one millionth worker and this is a skill that again few people have and therefore people who have very unique and valuable skills are going to earn a lot more money than people who have pretty ordinary skills and there are a lot of people who can do it who can do that. So what's going to change the demand? Well, again, we'll start with the uh, 7 million people earning $20,000 a year. Here's the demand as a marginal product of labor times marginal revenue, so the marginal revenue product of labor. Up here we have the 1 millionth person earning 140000 And when the demand for this labor goes up and it increases, well, the value of any other, any quantity of labor is higher. So the, that seven millionth worker went from twenty thousand dollars a year to sixty thousand dollars a year and that's because the demand for labor increased and this is what's been going on over the years why we earn more money today than we did say a hundred years ago that the more technology things like that have made our labor services more productive and therefore people earn more money now I don't show it here if that we took that demand curve and kept going higher that means that the one millionth worker instead of a hundred forty thousand may be at two hundred forty thousand dollars a year therefore their skills are more valuable at the margin that marginal value of that skill is higher going back to Nick Saban now Nick Saban his skills are so unique that's why he makes 9.1 million dollars a year he's very very high up on that marginal on that demand curve because the marginal value of his labor services are very very high so going back to this what we looked at before the total product based on the number of workers we have I hire one worker my output is five I hire a second worker my output jumps to twelve therefore the marginal product is seven I hire the third worker and it's twenty one I hire the fourth worker is twenty eight that increased by seven etc just like we had done before we see that my output increases at an increasing rate at first up until the fourth work a third worker and then my output increases at a decreasing rate it's increasing throughout the whole range of number of workers I hire but it increases at an increasing rate at first and then a decreasing rate well if the good that I sell let's say again it's bread and this is loaves of bread and each loaf sells for three dollars then I'm willing to pay up to fifteen for the first worker twenty one for the second uh, 27 for the third and again this is not paying each different worker this would be paying all workers tw all three workers $27 we're looking at the marginal value here if I hire the fourth worker then the wage falls to $21 for those four workers 15 9 and 3 the this again this is the value of marginal product here the wage to the price does not change we're in a perfectly competitive market here using the exact same labor and uh, product output and marginal product of labor we're going to just say the price of the product changes it goes from four to three seventy five so now I have a downward sloping demand curve I have to look at how much my price would change as I increase output this would be the marginal revenue product and we'll see that at four workers that it's both twenty one uh, you know, fewer than four workers then the wage is a little higher for then the value of marginal product or the marginal revenue product is higher than the value of marginal product and beyond four workers then it's a little less and we can draw this up let's draw up the demand for the uh, perfectly competitive firm and we'll see that when I hire one worker I'm willing to pay up to fifteen dollars an hour two workers I'm willing to pay up to twenty one dollars three workers twenty seven four workers twenty one 15 for the five higher five workers uh, three and then uh, sorry uh, nine and then three so nine dollars for the third uh, the sixth worker and three dollars for the seventh now keep in mind that when we talked about we have to earn at least our we have to get revenue above and beyond our variable costs we would not produce at any com any quantity of output that was produced by three workers or fewer we'd only start at four so my demand curve starts at four workers because I would shut down before I produce at any output below say 28 units and that would be three workers or less so this becomes my demand curve and now we see the demand curve for labor is downward sloping if you want me to hire if I have to just hire four workers then I'd be paying these workers twenty one dollars 
If you want me to hire a fourth, a fifth worker, then the wage rate for all workers would fall to 15. If hiring uh, six workers, the wage rate would fall to nine, etc. Now, let me, if you're going to look to the under the marginal product, I'm going to change that. I'm going to say it goes to six. It, it increases by one at each quantity of labor. Now that shifts my demand curve for labor. Because labor is more productive, that increases my demand for labor, and I'm willing to pay each worker a little more. Matter of fact, I'm willing to pay each worker $3 an hour more uh, based on that number, uh, the change in productivity. Alternatively, if you look now, I changed the hourly wage. I changed the price to from $3 to $4. So now instead of $15 for the first worker, it's $20. It's $28 for the second worker. And again, that changes the demand for labor this way. It actually makes it a little more inelastic, and that's when the price of the good changes. So this tells us how demand for labor is determined. It's based on the marginal output of hiring an additional worker times the price of whatever I could sell that output for. And that means that the revenue, I'm willing to pay a worker the amount that my revenue increases. So one last thing I want to look at, since I talked about labor augmenting capital, let's say we have workers here who the 10 million workers are paid $20,000 an hour, and then we increase, let's say this is people who build, who dig holes with shovels. And so we have 10 million people with shovels who dig holes. They're getting paid $20,000 an hour. And now all of a sudden, backhoes are invented. Well, this shifts the labor demand curve up. If I'm going to keep 10 million workers, I can pay. They now earn $40,000 a year. But I don't need 10 million workers now. I just need one person, maybe two for each backhoe. And that's what's going to happen now is the quantity of labor demanded is going to decrease. I don't need as many workers and so we get to this point here where now I'm hiring say 5 million workers and they're making $70,000 each. And this is how technology improves our our living standards because we have we have more capital per worker and as we have that we're more productive. Now we don't need as many people doing something but other things are created and so wages increase for those who have more capital per worker.